All right, good afternoon everyone. <laughs> well, welcome to this lecture. Th this is a special lecture because it sets out for you a summary of the things that you need to know to produce a piece of research. And it assumes that you've had an introduction to the theory of research and it goes on to, to highlight the practical points. And in it we're going to look at two kinds of research. All right, scientific research and an argumentative report. Uh, but before we do those things, we'll talk about some of the things that they have in common, some of the basic things. So, we begin with the purpose of the lecture. We'll talk about the basics of manuscript production. We'll talk about your first scientific manuscript. We assume that you don't know anything about this in the sense that you've never produced a piece of scientific research before and then your first argumentative report and then a little summary at the end. So the purpose of the lecture is about the production of manuscripts. These are the instructions for students but the lecture assumes you haven't produced a paper before but at point four it says once you have some experience you'll learn when you can break the rules. So I'm trying to give you a bit of firm guidance to start with, but bear in mind, once you get experienced, it won't be exactly like this. And also, the epistemological foundations, the basis on which, the nature of research is important, but we're not going to talk about that much today. So, the basics of manuscript production. First of all, there's a reason I put his picture there. You have to become an expert in the topic that you are going to, to research. You can't just suddenly wake up and say, I would like to be a researcher, here I go. And in real research, in, 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 in real projects for master's levels and beyond, quite often it can take a year to get into that position. So it's helpful if you're basing it on something that you've done before in another course. So you've got to know about your topic, but at number two, you've got to understand the research method. So you've also got to be a re an, an expert in the research method. So you've got two big tasks before you've done anything. Next, you have to derive your research proposal from a problem, from some sort of difficulty, from something that you see within the literature or perhaps in the practical world that you think, ah, now there's something strange there, I can work on that, I can do more with that. So you're looking for a problem. As a business student, you might find that your problems come from the practical world. All right, you can have those sorts of problems. But also, much more common is to get your problem from the academic discipline. So you become an expert on your topic, i.e. you become an expert on that aspect of the academic discipline, you find a problem within it, and then you are going to work on that problem. And lastly, follow the appropriate steps for both your method and your problem, and, and you'll work on that as we go. So the abilities of the researcher, some of your abilities are going to relate to your creativity, your use of imagination, your being insightful, your being original. But also, you have to be skillful, precise, logical, current, an expert. So on the one hand, you've got a lot of things that relate to freedom and your ability to be creative. On the other hand, you've got things that relate to discipline. Right? So you've got this play between freedom and discipline. And the man that developed these sorts of ideas first was Alfred North Whitehead. In about 1930-something, he wrote a paper called The Rhythmic Claims of Freedom and Discipline. He was talking more about education, but what he said applied to research too. The Rhythmic Claims of Freedom and Discipline. So when you're a researcher, sometimes you will be developing new things creatively, other times you will be doing the dog work all right, the basic dum 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 dum. All right, the dog work. For example, if you're trying to identify an issue in a research topic, freedom. There you are. 
if you, but recognizing the nature of the questions you're asking, that's a bit of hard work and that requires discipline and it comes from the intellectual discipline. If you're refining your topic or your issue or your research question, that requires discipline. You've, you've got to try and get some very precise statements, care with how you use words, care with what's realistic. Your research questions and you, you research your questions in academic databases, you're going to be taught about this shortly. Discipline, right? Research strategy in databases, that's a discipline. That's where you have to follow rules. Formulating your question and inquiry method, well, you have freedom there. Working originally on all parts of your paper at once, well, that's both freedom and discipline, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. Drawing conclusions is also a freedom and discipline thing, but writing well, of course, is a discipline thing. So let's orient you to this first paper. Often students say they want to see an example of a good paper. They say, just show me what you want. And, and I've got an answer to that. I say, look, look in any of the academic journals that you wish. You will see papers published. They are all your examples. They are all your models. And Here's a tip for nothing. When you're writing a paper, try and find a paper that's like yours. All right, and that serves as a sort of guide and a model. And I, I say it, it takes me a half a minute to say it. It'll take you days to find your paper. All right, there's a lot of work in finding papers like that. Searching, you have to have a lot of patience. It's a good thing to do it late at night. Just keep going till the morning. That's how you do that, I'm afraid. Each journal has its own style requirements, but sh students should learn that style of the American Psychological Association, known as APA. That's what we use in this course, and that's what you're going to be taught. And your writing style is important, and I'll pick this up in a moment, but um, there are many style guides, but the one that I picked on was The Economist's one. Do you know the British newspaper, The Economist? They provide quite a nice little style guide that's online, and also there's a text. Okay, now, you must teach yourself APA. I am not going to teach you APA except in a very basic kind of way. You're going to have to teach it to yourself, basically. Uh, once you've mastered it, the good news is that you'll have it for life. To do this, the resources, you have the APA website, which is quite interesting. There's two parts to it that you need to look at, the basics of APA style and their video tutorials, of which they've got about eight or nine of them, uh, and I will tell you which five or six are the most important for you. And find for yourself somewhere on the internet, be it in English or Chinese, a short guide to APA. I mean a little summary in about two pages. There's dozens if not hundreds of them on the internet. Find yourself one that you can read and you like and just keep that handy. When you learn APA, there's two different things that you're learning. The first one is the structure of manuscripts, how you actually have to go about setting up a title page, the margins, the fonts, the headings, what goes where in your paper, right? And then the second thing you have to learn from APA is referencing, of which there's two parts, in-text referencing and a reference list. And a reference list, it is exactly the same thing as the word bibliography. Bibliography, reference list. In your papers, never put reference list, but you could just say references as a heading at the end. References, or if you want to, you can say bibliography, whatever you wish, either way. That's the APA publication manual. That is the basic set of rules, and, and, and they get debated and discussed and developed. But at the end of the day, those are the rules that, that count in the manual. Uh, and you'll be able to see the manual in various places. Nextly, you must use bibliographic software. And your choices are either EndNote, which, you use in, which people in the West use, or Note Express. All right? EndNote is quite expensive. Uh, if you buy EndNote, um, you're up for a few hundred dollars. Um, and students sometimes do buy EndNote, but most universities in the West provide EndNote to their students, okay? And usually there's a little cost, like $5, 
So the little cost and you get in note and then a lot of universities got tired of bothering to charge and then they just give it away to their students for nothing. Uh, but the university has to pay a lot of money to the EndNote people, which is an American company. Some very smart people in China, probably about 10 years ago, said, we don't want to pay that lot a heap of money. Why can't we write our own version? And they did, and it's called Note Express. Like, it's Note Express. It's about a third of the cost of EndNote if you buy it. If you buy it. But don't, don't you buy it because your university's already bought it and it provides it to you through your library for nothing and you will have a special session on that. You must learn about it. You must be able to use it. So, what do you use it for? Ah, one other thing here. It's really important that you take the time necessary to learn to use it because I don't want to get to the end of the course and find you making simple little mistakes in your referencing and so forth because you haven't gotten end notes sorted out. That will annoy me considerably and it'll upset you because if I'm upset, you're upset. So that's one thing. Secondly, when you start to, to work with EndNote, you'll be asked to start an EndNote library file, right? Only start one. Only ever have one EndNote library file, okay? You're, you're never going to need two. So keep all your stuff in one place. It's very searchable and it will simplify life considerably and keep a backup copy of it somewhere from time to time in case you lose the lot. So put everything in the one file, and I think in your work you, you call that file um, uh, with your student number, which helps me to see how it goes. Okay, so one file. You must know how to add references to, and it means to Note Express, books from within the program. In other words, you go into Note Express and then you find books and you find them in libraries, for example, the Library of Congress in America or the British Library in London, you can access both of those through Note Express. Okay? So you find books. Nextly, articles from academic databases, and you're going to have a special session on that. Nextly, you must know how to add websites, and that's the sort of technique that you'll need to look at uh, as to how you do that in Note Express. You must also know how to show Chinese publications which basically means you do it in Chinese and then you put in brackets after all the Chinese bits the English version. Okay, the English version. That's your basic technique. You must know how to set the output style to APA, otherwise your papers won't come out in APA style, your papers will come out in something else. And you must know how to insert in-text references. Now, a point about how you actually produce research. This is about the, the, the working methods that you adopt. First of all, you're going to be busy and your ideas are going to change as the weeks go by. What you think is your topic at the start is not necessarily going to end up as your topic. Who you think are going to be your research subjects may not end up as your research subjects. You will have ideas and you will be changing your mind. You will be finding new things, new academic papers in the literature as the weeks go on, and they will change the way you think about your paper. They will give you bright ideas. So, from the first day of your project, you must write things into your paper when ideas or references come to you. This is why I have you, and you're doing this shortly, setting out the outline for the headings of your paper. And it might be, the heading conclusion is right at the end, but it might be that next week you have an idea about something that could go in the conclusion. Next week's when you write it in. All right? It won't end up as you write it. You're going to edit it, change it, you might take it out. But if it relates to the conclusion, let's not lose the idea when you actually get it. You put it straight into your, into your paper. Nothing will end up in your paper which is not directly, does not directly contribute to your research question. So although you might be putting a heap of stuff in your paper, ultimately you're going to have to edit it really hard so that it has a direction at your research question. Now, it so happens that this technique of working on all the parts of the paper at once, as it were, 
First of all, it's the best way, and secondly, it's got, some people would say that it is to develop your paper organically, organically. It's like a growing child. When a child grows, you know how different bits grow, different times a little bit, but basically the child grows and develops and gets bigger, all in proportion. That's how your paper's going to go. It's going to develop all over at once. And that's called writing organically. It's a holistic approach to growth and development. It's got a little tick next to it. The alternative is linear writing, where you say, right, I write the title, now I'm going to write the introduction, now I'm going to write the method, several weeks later I'm going to put in the results, and right at the end I'm going to write the conclusions. That's a recipe for disaster, <laughs> all right? It doesn't work like that. You're going to have to churn away at all of it. You don't, don't try and do it in a linear fashion. And there's an example of this. Somebody did this picture in one of the textbooks from a literature review process. It's organic and it's iterative. Iterative makes you keep turning around and coming at the same thing again and again. You do something, you go somewhere else, you come around and then you're back where you started. And you can see they start down the bottom here. Research questions and objectives. Their task is to write a critical review of the literature. They begin with their research questions and then they keep drafting and they keep finding stuff and they keep generating stuff and so it goes on until they end up with the product. I mentioned the style guide. That one is quite good, it's easy to get hold of. It begins like this, it's done by the Economist, um, the journal The Economist. Uh, and they emphasize, as you can see there, keeping things nice and clear. Nice and clear. That, you know, the most important thing is that people can read your paper and say, yes, that's what she means, or that's what he means. It's got to be nice and clear. Okay? But getting it there is quite hard. You now have to look at this particular page, this web page, find it, read those things and think about them for a bit, and then go through A, B, C, D, E, looking at the things that are there, getting to be familiar with it. So that's where you go when you've got questions about writing, which you will have. Questions about writing will occur. For example, you might be mentioning somebody's name. How do you mention a name in a, in a paper? Depends on the nature of the paper, what kind of paper, how you will mention their name. These things are things that you need to think about. Another thing that's important is the whole question of standards, academic standards, research standards if you like, or, or another word for it, scholarship. Scholarship. That's important too. Now, it so happens that there are different kinds of things produced, different sorts of research produced, and we've got three of them there, philosophical methods, operational research methods, and scientific methods. The standards for the three groups are somewhat different. Operational research methods, things like marketing research, policy research and evaluations, these are done for clients. Right? These are contracted projects that you do to satisfy a particular person's need for something. The standards relate to that person and what they will accept as being worth paying for. Okay? That's different from the standards in scientific methods and, and also in philosophical methods. The standards for scientific methods and philosophical methods are public standards. It's no private arrangement by, between any people. It's actually the research community as a whole working together. They decide what are the standards and the more senior people, they argue about it. And, and in journals, particularly with journal editors, the standards emerge. They're pretty settled. They don't change a lot, a lot of them. So the standards are going to be a bit different. So I say over there, different methods have their own standards, but many standards are universal. You might be writing a scientific paper and you have to introduce your topic. You have to give a literature review of your topic. Guess what? The standards come from up here. Right? Literature review standards are a part of the philosophical methods. 
So although you're writing a scientific paper, the introduction, which has the literature review, its standards come from here. Okay? So, this takes us to your first scientific manuscript. that will be a great moment when you see your name in print. You're going to be there. Right from now, although you've never written a paper like this before, work on making it publishable. That's the goal, to produce something that can be published. Okay? Go straight to that. Don't, don't say, oh, I'm just practicing. Straight to that. Okay? Write in the third, whoops, extra one. Write in the third person. Never use passive verbs when you can use an active verb. And we'll talk about that later on. Refer to authors by their family name only in a scientific paper. Look at the four authors section of journal websites. This is a little bit of homework for you. Look at some journals, the ones where you find articles that interest you, and see what they say to authors. They all say pretty much the same stuff and it's very similar to what I'm saying to you now. Right? And then lastly here, use a textbook on the methodology of the social sciences. You've got one set for this course, that would be a really good one to use. You might want to, so, to, to, to use extra uh, books which we've got which you can see. So, so that, that's fine. Uh, but if you're, if you're looking to, to develop the population for your study and the sample, then you better read the chapters on population and sample in the textbooks so that you know what you're doing. You have to master that so that you can get that right. All right? So science is communal. And by that I mean that everything in science needs to be published, made available to others so that others can scrutinize it and have an opinion on it and, if they can't, and, and replicate it show that it is right. There is nothing to be hidden in science. It is a communal activity. Science doesn't belong to the West. It doesn't belong to China. It doesn't belong to any particular group. It belongs to humankind. All right, it's humankind's. Uh, and if we were doing the philosophy of science, we could talk a lot about that. That leads some people to say that it is objective, and, and there's a lot of things that you could say about this word objective, but most people would say science is objective, and science is discipline-based. You can't suddenly wake up tomorrow morning and say, I'm going to start a science. Science churns from within the discipline. Science comes from within itself. So when you come to do your research paper, and you've got to do a research question, that research question, if you're doing science, must come from the scientific discipline that pertains to, your, to what you're about. Okay? So if you're doing a, something in social psychology, then you must know about social psychology, you must know about the area of your topic, you must know what other people have written, right? and then you derive your work from there. From there. So, hypothesis, procedures, data, findings, hypothesis, procedures, data, findings, da 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 da, da. That kind of flow is what happens in science and you're going to be a part of that. Uh, a scientific paper really does follow that kind, of, that kind of model. So you will develop a hypothesis, you will have a method, you will have results, you will have conclusions, and then somebody else will be able to use your work to develop another hypothesis, and so it goes on. The headings in a social science research paper, be it in business or sociology or psychology or anything else, title page, which APA sets out, an abstract, an introduction. In your introduction, it is an introduction to the topic, not to your interest in it, it is just the topic. Take yourself out of this. We don't want to know about you. Always write science as if you didn't exist. Focused on a, it's a focused literature review. It's, in fact, a, a, an inquiry into the literature, but it's heading towards something. 
what it's heading towards, in fact, is your uh, hypothesis, your research hypothesis. All right, so there's also the introduction to your hypothesis. Separate section, the hypothesis, which is the one I'm going to look really hard at. Your method, population and sample, instrument development, that in, but when you use the word instrument here, you mean survey instrument or test instrument, right? The bit of paper that you put in front of people if that's what you're, you're doing. Or it might be the questions that you have if you're interviewing people, those sorts of things. That's the instrument. You will do trials or pretests as you develop an instrument, and that you will put in your paper and report on, and that's in the method section. You also say something about the administration of the instrument. When, who, how, etc. You get real results, you get your conclusions, you have your references and you have your appendix. What goes in the appendix? Ah, well, we'll come to that in a moment. A little bit about finding your topic. Always, a, always a, an excitement. I said that science is communal and your topic has to come out of a discipline of science. In your case, social science, probably related to business in some way. You must build on the work of others. Your introduction, you can assume the reader already has a reasonable knowledge of your discipline. Right? It's like writing for one of your professors. They already know about it. It's not like writing for one of your students, one of your colleague students. All right? You're writing for somebody that already knows. You elaborate your precise topic for your professors. This is a literature review. Right? And we will have videos and things on what makes a good literature review. You say why your topic is worthwhile. If you're going to do this and put all this effort in, you must say why you're heading in this direction. Show how your work will relate to earlier work. This is this link to the discipline. And lead into your hypothesis you'll probably end up with more than 10 references for this section alone. Um, students sometimes get up to 50 in this, uh, and you could do quite a lot of pages trying to set up your topic. How many you end up with depends on the nature of your topic. Write an hypothesis. There are levels of question definition. At the most, at A is the most general, there's the sort of general topic. From the general topic emerges your precise topic. From your precise topic, you're heading into a research problem. From your research problem, you are heading into a research hypothesis. It might sound a bit abstract now, but in actual fact, when you come to do this, it's not as complicated as it perhaps looks. It's usual to make the hypothesis negative because we can only disprove things. All right, that's why you read in, in statistical tests. We are testing that there is no difference between the males and the females in this class of students in relation to something. We're trying to show that there is no difference because we can't prove the positive. We can't prove there is a difference. Okay, and that, that is based on a little bit of philosophy of science. Okay, and lastly, as I've said before, you, you, your professor must approve your hypothesis because it's so central. So, you're working on your hypothesis, but you also have to develop your method, your research method. You've got to become an expert on your method. Consider papers where others have used this method. You'll find them in academic journals, but you can also search university and other thesis databases. So you can see the theses that other students have done, masters and doctoral students particularly, but, but also dissertation students at lower levels. You can see the work that they have done. And, and again, if you can find something that's a bit like what you're doing, that will be gold for you. That will be treasure. Right? You'll be very pleased to see what somebody else is doing. It'll give you a lot of clues. And if you can get two or three people that are working in your area, and you can read their papers, then all of a sudden you've got a base on which you can build. And also you find, what have these people done? Wow, they've got references you didn't hear of, you never found. Oh, that's interesting. Chase, 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 chase. And if you can't get a reference, if you can't chase it down yourself, 
there are people in the library whose job it is to help you do that. All right, and I can give you the email address and you send them the thing and you say, I need done. And they, they will help you, okay? You must adapt the method for your situation and your hypothesis. Now, the obvious example of that is cross-cultural work. I mean, you might find a paper that was done in Britain, for example, by a student there or by somebody there, and they had a sample. Maybe they were university students like you, master's students at your level. They did this thing with them. Wow. Well, you can just uplift it and say, well, I'm going to do the Chinese version. And that's a really good start. But in doing the Chinese version, there's going to be lots of differences. Because an instrument that works in Britain, you can't just pick it up and use it here. All right? I'm, I'm involved in the study with, with your professor um, that we're looking at um, cheating, students cheating. And it just so happens that I've got a friend in New Zealand who comes from America and he's, he's doing this, he's got this test instrument on cheating, this questionnaire thing on cheating. And he's given it to students in a few different countries. And I said, oh, I, I could, could use it in China and see what happens. Now, it's very easy for me to say that. I could use it in China, no problem. But I know that in actual fact, it's going to require a lot of work because there is just, it's, you just can't pick up an instrument that's used, say, in Britain and use it here. It's got to be adapted and modified to take account of the different cultures in the two places, and there's a heap of work in that. There's a heap of work in that. And quite often projects like that don't really come to fruition in a good way because it's just too difficult. It's, yeah, you're in different worlds. Okay. So you're adapting it to your situation and your hypothesis. But the point for you is that you're going to, you, you've found the method as other people have used it, now you've got to work out how you are going to use it. Right? And, and, and you won't have to say, oh, I'm going to make it different. That will just happen. Practical limitations, you're a student working in a class situation, you're only going to have access to certain subjects. All right? Probably you will, your subjects will be university students. That's, that's the most usual thing. Uh, but you might, you, you, you might study some other group, um, that, that's possible and interesting. Uh, and you're going to report on your trials and your pretests as you develop your instrument, and you will find that your project develops organically again. You might start doing this cross-cultural thing, for example, and then you're, you've got an hypothesis, but after a few weeks you think, hmm, this isn't working out very well. Maybe I better change my hypothesis. Maybe I need to sort of look at something a little bit different. Uh, and in that process, you're, you're now being a real researcher. You're actually starting to get to grips with the problems. So that, that that's, can be quite a good moment. And I, I usually take a fairly skeptical line with the students. And I say, oh, you really want to do that? Uh, and, and, and they say, well, I've tried it this way and I can't do it this way. <laughs> OK, so there's a discussion. So who are your subjects? In social science research, you have to define your population. And that can be quite exciting. All the students in uh, master's courses in, ch in China. Wow. You know, you can't study master's students in China. They're too diverse. They're all over the place. There's absolutely no way you could get a sample of them. You will be hard pushed to get a sample of your classmates. Right? So you might want to define your population as the students at this university who are taking a particular course, and then you get a sample of those students, which you can get in a random way, because you can get all their student numbers and randomise them. OK, so defining the population is a funsy thing. Then you have to show how your sample represents your population. We won't talk about that now, and you have to relate, relate your population to the work of others. You have to be practical. Consider the hypothesis, consider your resources, consider your access to subjects, consider the time constraints and the cost. You can't develop a research instrument that's going to require you to hire a team of researchers because you haven't got the money. So <laughs> you're going to have to try and do it yourself. All right, and your professor must approve your population and your sample. Right? That's another one of those check-off points. What about your appendix? 
The appendix is right at the end of the report. Well, if you've got a research instrument, that's a really good place to put it. That's Appendix A. Appendix B, your raw data. That's a really good thing to do so that I can see what you're up to and what you got and whether or not you've interpreted it in a, in a fair way. And any statistical work that you do is often put there. Right? Some of that might find its way into the results section like as a little summary. But it's important that you have the appendix that gives your work because that actually is a part of, of the scientific criteria, scientific standard. You'll, we have to be able to check on everything and this is where you present your evidence. Right? Make a point of referring to the appendix in your main text, right? Appendix uh, B, line 53 says da dum da dum and we take this to be evidence that, all right? <laughs> that sort of statement. If you develop your paper for an editor, you'll probably not include the appendices simply because they won't have the room to publish them. Sometimes they do ask for them, but you should have it all there uh, in, in a proper form as backing for your paper so that you can give it to somebody. So that was your first scientific paper. We've gone through the the broad brush with that. Now what about an argumentative report, a different kind of research? Well, the job, the task, what you're trying to do in this sort of paper is to improve something. Xi Jinping ought to do this. All right? That's the sort of thing we're looking at. Right. Don't, don't get a, a low a low sort of, uh, an unambitious sort of thing. Don't say, oh, instead of walking around and doing his, 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 his cleaning that way to the left and to the right, the grounds, groundsman, the person who's cleaning outside, should go from the right to the left. All right, trivial, not important. All right, we're talking about important things. But what you say has got to be practical too. You're in the real world here. And, and, and if you're thinking about writing on some improvement for education, for example, you can look on the, on, the, on the website for the Ministry of Education and you can see the pictures of all the people who are in charge of it and a little bit about them and so forth. If you've got some sort of thing that you're advocating for education, these are the people you're writing for. So I know students that will take the pictures from various things, not in this country, but take the pictures and, and they they, they put them on a big piece of paper and they pinned them to their wall. And I said, what, what have you got there? And they said, well, we're writing for them. Right? We're reminding ourselves we're writing for them. So uh, that, that's, that's a good way to go. Okay. So your paper has to be practical. This is real world stuff. It has to be precise enough to be genuinely useful. I had a student last year, wrote us paper and he said China ought to da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. he argued China ought to this well he just he only just passed to be he came very close to not passing why did he only just pass because it's too general who's supposed to do that China ought to you should do that you should do that I don't know maybe it was Xi Jinping again but whoever it was he didn't make it clear did he he needs to, it needs to be precise enough. So it's got to actually have a practical orientation, be precise enough to be gen, uh, useful, directed at somebody, reflect your expert understanding of practice, the industry, the business, the government literature. You can't go giving advice to people unless you know what they already know. <laughs> you've got to get yourself ahead of the game. So you've got to read and, and, and find out about things and then you'll be in a position to give them advice. And the academic literature also, which is your third wing. So an argumentative paper is basically about that. And it's trying to improve something. It takes the form, someone ought to something. That's what you're arguing. Now the manuscript headings for an argumentative paper a little bit different from a science paper, but, but, but some similarity too. You have your title page and you have your abstract. Introduction 
as a focused literature review again. A little bit different here because your literature review may well include government and industry sources. All right? And then you've got the challenge of referencing these correctly. And this raises a real question of what's a legitimate reference for a piece of work like this. Because you can find a blog somewhere where somebody said something, but the question is, is, it, is that a reference that you can actually use in your work? Possibly not. It just depends who the someone is. If he's a retired professor from, 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 from Beijing, well, maybe, he, maybe he's fine. And you know who he is, so that, that's okay. But if it's just somebody from up the road who happened to write a blog, that's a different thing. All right? So, introduction to your topic, the academic aspects, and also you've got the practical aspects, so it's already bigger. Introduction to the problem or area of concern, why it's worthwhile sorting this thing out, what are the advantages of working here, and then you have your proposition. This is the someone ought to something. In some books they call this the thesis. This is thesis in the narrow sense of the word. You can also say thesis meaning the book that a student has written. All right, that's a big sense of the word thesis. But a thesis is just a narrow thing, a proposition or if you like a proposal. Right. I wouldn't use the word proposal because it's a bit wishy-washy, but, but the, the, the proper word to use is proposition, which says, I propose that. That's what you're saying. But of course, you don't put yourself in this stuff. You take, again, don't ever write about yourself. Get, get you out of it. And then at least three reasons in support of your proposition. And often in the, when students do their three reasons, they bring in their further references because you've got to support your reasons. And one of the challenges of a reason is that sometimes reasons can be um, very quick to write at first. You might, you might say, well, it will bring economic benefits. That's a reason. It's not a good enough reason for this, though. If you're going to say it's going to bring economic benefits, to whom's it going to bring economic benefits? What's the mechanism of this? You prove it to me. You say it's going to bring economic benefits. I need to know who, what, where, and why. I need to have that case laid down. Then you've got a reason. So bring economic benefits, says the student. That's a few lines. But by the time they've worked on it for two or three weeks, they've now written five pages saying who's going to benefit, how they're going to benefit. And then they'll get halfway through. And do you know what's going to happen? They get halfway through and they think, actually, there aren't that many economic benefits after all. <laughs> all right? And so you've then got a whole different kind of development. All right? So then you go back. You, you think you're organic at this point, and you go back and you say, oh, not it will bring economic benefits. It has some potential to bring economic benefits. Woolly it out a bit. It has some potential. It's easier to prove it has some potential than it is to prove it will bring economic benefits. And of course your paper, it gets lighter in some ways, but it gets more credible in other ways. When you get to your conclusions, well, obviously don't claim anything that you haven't established, be careful, uh, and talk about the limitations of your study. So if your study relates to, to you've made inquiries of students at this university, you can't assume the university up the road would give you the same results. You say, well, you know, I, I looked at this university, it's possible that things are different elsewhere in other parts of the province. Uh, and then you, you, a good, uh, something that goes well here is a, a case being made about the, um, the implementations. Well, you've got ideas, you're saying somebody ought to do something. Just think what happens when they do do it. All right? It might have unexpected effects. Plenty of examples of public policy where we've had something come in, unexpected effects. Right? And you can think of examples in China without any difficulty, but you can in any country. So implementation problems, and then you end with some sort of call for action, some sort of upbeat statement at the end that says that you know, they ought to get on with this. <laughs> it's costing us time, effort, and money if they don't. And then your bibliography. The standards. 
well, your proposition or your thesis statement, it's got to be specific, it's got to be practical, and it's got to be worthwhile. Say exactly what someone should do. Your reasons have to convince us. They have to be compelling. Keep yourself out of it. We're not interested in what your interests are. You're, you know, you, 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 you fade into the background, I'm afraid. <laughs> this isn't primary school. Always use active verbs in this. In the earlier one I said, it's really good if you can use active verbs. In the scientific paper, it's great to use active verbs. In this one, if everything ends in ing, you know, we're thinking about coming forward perhaps maybe. It's not going to convince anybody of anything, all right? So you need active verbs. Uh, and refer to public people by their family name uh, after the first mention. So you might, for example, mention um, the chairman of, of the um, Communist Party at the university, and you would give his full name, and you would give his, his position. A and in a paper like this, you may, might sort of give a little bit of a commentary on him, but not too much. You know, the, the, the extremely experienced. If he's been there a long time, you could say that. Uh, or the new, if he's only been there a short time. You could just give a little bit there. But once you've done that, as your paper goes on, you just refer to him by his family name. Okay? So, so that, that solves that. Uh, right. So that brings us to the end of the overview. Thank you very much. Mm.